What's up NZers and welcome back to another reaction video where it is just myself and my lovely wife Nadine and we are here to check out a few more videos and today we have actually got one, uh, this is another one that has been hotly requested but we just haven't got around to doing it right. until now. Yes. So this one is about the Green Beret who went on a one man rampage to save his comrades. What is a Green Beret? Like I know what a Green Beret is. That's actually a very good question. I don't know what I don't know if it has anything to do with the Marines or the SEALs or if it's a totally different like branch of special forces or something like that, but I wouldn't have a clue. Maybe it's something else we need to look into. Yeah. Maybe, where's Green Beret boot camp? Yeah, like how do you become a Green Beret? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, let's check it out. I think his name is Roy Benavides. Benavides. Yeah, from the title. The Green Beret went on a one-man rampage. Roy Benavides, the Vietnam War. Roy Benavidez's life had been rough as a child. Both his parents had died. He was bullied by his classmates because of his mixed Yakui Indian and Mexican heritage and oh, wow. had to leave school in eighth grade to help his family. At the age of 19, Benavidez joined the army, serving in the Korean War in the Texas Army National Guard. He married Hilaria Lala Coy Benavidez in 1959 and completed airborne training, becoming assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. In 1966, Sergeant Roy Benavidez was in hospital after stepping on a landmine. Ooh. Doctors said he would never walk again. Wow. He had been sent to Vietnam in 1965 as an advisor for the ARVN troops there. Benavidez was carrying out a classified operation alone to gather evidence that the North Vietnamese troops were posing as Viet Cong. While Stealth. he was on patrol along a narrow trail disguised as a Viet Cong guerrilla, <clears throat> he stepped on a landmine. Again. Some time later, a squad of Marines came across Benavidez. Wow. They initially thought it was a booby trap, but were surprised when they flipped him over and discovered the man in Viet Cong pajamas was Hispanic and wearing U.S. Army dog tags. He was soon evacuated to the hospital. In hospital in the U.S. two months later, Benavides had recovered and awoke. His memories came back to him. The doctor oh, is it the same lamb as before? Again. His spine had been damaged and his brain had rattled in his skull. <clears throat> wow. Nevertheless, Benavides sitting wow. in his wheelchair begged the doctors not to discharge him from the army. The army was his life. Wow. Determined, Benavidez got up from his bed night after night, dragging himself to the wall and putting weight on his legs. For weeks, he pushed through the pain, going further a distance than before, wow. which surprised the doctors. Six months later, with his wife Lala's support, Roy Benavidez walked out of the hospital. He was wow. promised only a desk job at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, but determined and exercising every day he trained vigorously and qualified for the Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. He was Whoa. assigned to Detachment B-56, 5th <coughs> Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces. What grit, Six eh? hours wow. in hell. Getting blown up. Mm. Now it was 1968. Staff Sergeant Roy Benavides, now with a code name Tango Mike Mike, was back in Vietnam and was off duty attending church. His mind was fixed on the panicking radio chatter from the front lines. In Lok Ninh, Vietnam, near the Cambodian border, a 12-man Special Forces reconnaissance team, which included his close friends, Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, Staff Sergeant Lloyd Frenchy Mousseau, Specialist 4 Brian O'Connor, and nine Montagnard tribesmen who were part of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group Program, or CIDG, were surrounded by a battalion numbering 1,000 battle-hardened North Vietnamese soldiers. Whoa. Everyone in the unit had been wounded or killed in earlier fighting, and three of the helicopters sent to <coughs> rescue them had been unable to extract them due to heavy enemy fire. When the helicopters returned, they were riddled with bullets. One of them, the door gunner, Michael Craig, age 19, had been hit several times and died in Benavidez's arms. Mm. There was no way Benavidez was going to leave his friends out in the jungle. Payback time. Benavidez jumped onto a returning helicopter that was going back in, volunteering so quickly that he didn't have time to get his M16, so was only armed with a Bowie knife and medical supplies. The sky. No way. Benavidez described it as going into autopilot. As he was approaching the extraction zone, Benavidez realized his fellow team members were too severely wounded to run the distance to the helicopter. There was so much enemy gunfire that the pilot, Larry McKibben, had to zigzag in an attempt to dodge it, but was nevertheless able to provide cover and fire. Benavidez jumped out with a medical bag, ran through the jungle to the wounded men under heavy enemy fire, wow. taking a shot to the leg, which he initially thought was a thorn bush. He found Musso first against a oh. tree whose eyeball had been shot out 
and was hanging down his cheek. He oh. was determined to keep shooting back. The CIDG were in a pool of blood and patched up as best they could. Benavidez dragged everyone into a defensible position to direct their fire at the enemy and provided wow. morphine to the wounded. He then saw O'Connor and an interpreter CIDG who he motioned to to move over to him. But the gunfire started again and they took cover. Another round then hit Benavidez in his thigh. On adrenaline, he popped the green smoke for McKibben in the rescue helicopter to pick them up. While everyone who could move got into the chopper, he suppressed the tree line with an AK-47 he had picked up to cover O'Connor and the interpreter who crawled towards the helicopter. Now Benavides was looking for the team leader, Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, who had been killed and who also had intel on him that could not get into enemy hands. Benavides found his body and proceeded to drag him to the chopper when he was shot again, this time in the stomach and hit in the back by shrapnel from a nearby grenade, what? knocking him out. When he awoke, Benavides was forced to leave his dead friend's body. Disaster had also struck. The chopper had crashed to the ground oh, from enemy goodness. fire. The pilot, McKibben, was dead. Oh, wow. Five of the men on board, including Mousseau, survived the crash, as did O'Connor and the interpreter who didn't get into the helicopter. Benavidez pulled them out of the wreckage, dispensed morphine, oh, set up a perimeter around the crash site, and called in heavy air support from the F-100s above to truck napalm on the enemy position. When the jets ran out of fuel and had to leave, the enemy machine gun fire started again. Benavidez gave O'Connor a third shot of morphine and took another bullet to the leg. Oh my goodness. The position was surrounded by North Vietnamese soldiers. It looked hopeless. But a helicopter finally came to their rescue. Benavidez and the rescue team carried and dragged the wounded men onto the chopper, but the landing zone was still being fired upon by NVA troops oh. to the extent that two men were shot in the back as they crawled to it. Oh. Shrapnel wounds to his face from earlier caused Benavidez's vision to be blurred from the blood in his eyes. When he went to get Mousseau, an NVA soldier butted his rifle into Benavides's head and jaw and slashed his arm with his bayonet. What? He shouted to O'Connor to shoot, but he was too drugged for morphine to react. Benavides pulled out his bowie knife and stabbed the NVA soldier till he was dead. He then dragged Mousseau to the helicopter and killed two more NVA with an AK-47 who were out of the helicopter's side gunner's arc of fire. And then he made one more trip to get the interpreter and destroy any classified material with blood still obscuring his vision. Oh, only then and three bullet he wounds. the others to pull him onto the helicopter. The last man to leave the battlefield. At this point, the round that had hit his stomach had exposed his intestines, which he was trying to hold in with his hands. Oh my oh, god. The wow. Badly shot up and with no instruments left, managed to take off. Wow. Oh, what? Oh my when they goodness. Landed, the wounded were unloaded and examined one by one. It had turned out that Benavides had even loaded three dead enemy soldiers into the helicopter in case they had classified materials. They were left to the side Just in case. as was Benavides. He couldn't move or speak because of the broken jaw from the rifle bite. The blood over his eyes had glued them shut. There were 37 bayonet, bullet, and shrapnel wounds oh all over his God. body. He looked dead. The medics started placing him in a body bag and started zipping him up when a friend noticed him and said, That's Roy. That's Roy Benavidez. The doctor said there was nothing that could be done, but Benavidez mustered his last bit of energy and spat in the doctor's face, causing the doctor to say, I think he'll make it. He was <laughs> flown to Japan for intensive okay. surgery then Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston, where he stayed for almost a year. Roy Benavides had survived six hours in hell and saved eight lives. Benavides's commander had put him in for the Distinguished Service Cross because the process for awarding a Medal of Honor would take much longer, and he was unsure if Benavides would live or die before he could have received it. Finally, on February 24th, 1981, President Ronald Reagan would present Roy Benavides the Medal of Honor. Reagan said, if the story of his heroism were a movie script, you would not believe it. Mm. Benavidez said of his actions, wow. the real heroes are the ones who gave their lives for their country. I don't like to be called a hero. I just did what I was trained to do. Master wow. Sergeant Roy Benavidez died on November 29, 1998, at the age of 63. Wowie. Um, yeah, if that was a movie. Oh wait, is there still more? Subscribe for more oh. Vietnam War history. Wow. If yeah. that was a movie, I would be like, ah, uh, 
Yeah. This is not believable anymore. It's no, too much. <laughs> but I was just I was, I was just thinking that. I was like, uh, why haven't they made a movie about this yet? Yeah. Cause, well, because no one would believe it. Well, it doesn't matter. We're still <laughs> making like, well, insane... that was a bit over the top. Yeah. You'd definitely be dead by now. <laughs> but imagine being able to make that movie and then saying based on a true story. I know. At the end, people would just be like, whoa. Have they not made a movie? Yeah. They should. This guy needs a movie. Wow. 100%. What a story. Yeah. Very gruesome. Whew. And there's a reason why we don't have the kids Yeah, that's with just us. the horrors of war, I guess. I mean, so. the eyeball on the cheek. Oh, Denzel would the like... The guts hanging out? <laughs> and Denzel... No. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it wouldn't have been good. <laughs> wow, yeah. I never heard that story before. No, neither. Had no idea. I mean, I, we don't even know what a Green Beret is. No. So, <laughs> yeah. Some men just have something, oh, eh? They just, they like... They just have something. They're like, my life is whatever, you know, like... Or they're just like, they just keep going. Yeah. No, I know. But it's like, they've got no sort of self-preservation thing. It's just, all they see is like, they're dying, you yeah. know... Uh, soldiers, fellow soldiers, and they, all they can think of is rescuing them. And they just keep going. Yeah, they like have, they're, thinking, probably never, he probably doesn't even think about death. No, probably just doesn't just get he's keeps just going, like, and just going, get the job done. Yeah. But I was thinking, even after he <clears throat> had the leg situation where they said he wouldn't walk again with the mine. Yeah, yeah. Imagine he had just taken that diagnosis and been like, "I'll never walk again," and just like sat in a wheelchair. Yeah, and been depressed and stuff like, like that. Because it takes a certain amount of mental, like, "Yes, I am going to walk again," and then he did. Yeah, yeah. It takes Imagine the mindset. Yeah, it's it's the mindset. Mm. Imagine just receiving that and being like, "Oh, stink! I'm never going to walk again," and then yeah. that would have been the end of the story. Yeah, because even if something like that happens to you, it's still your choice how you react to it. Yeah, and how much you try and. Fix it. It's like he's got something up here, right? Yeah. He's got something up yeah, here. Yeah, he's got another layer. Another layer that like, a lot <laughs> the of rest of us don't have. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, if you enjoyed that one, make sure you smash the like button and let us know if there's any other uh, crazy stories like this that we need to check out. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Because, yeah, that was really cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, a little bit gruesome, but, yeah, it was interesting. It's, yeah. his, it's historical, so, yeah. you know, it's, all, it's worth learning. And imagine, see, the fact that we're still talking about this man today. Yes. And learning about him. Exactly. Yeah. Hero. Hero. Yeah. Anyway, guys, we love you and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>